Michael Verney, it's very much county final season, semi final season. It has the real feeling of the business end of the year. And like the county finals are racking up, like Limerick is on this weekend, Dublin is on this weekend, Tipperary, and so on and so forth go to Kerry. It, it really does have that feeling of, of, of hitting the, the most important stuff, doesn't it? It definitely does, and even just the news that, that people are going to be let back into venues and things like that. Like it's just, I'd say there's a mad, mad rush in clubs. I'd say secretaries, PROs, chairman, everybody involved in clubs are being put under massive, massive pressure for uh, the few kind of golden tickets that are available. But yeah, it definitely has that feeling. Like there's not, there's very few counties where there's group games still going on. It's all semi finals. And, uh, and county finals in hurling particularly because there's probably a lot less counties even involved playing top level hurling and some counties are only going straight to semi-finals and finals so it's far, much further on than the football in most counties and yeah some some savage games to look ahead to this weekend isn't it i was sp- speaking with schlock neil manager michael mcshane this week and he was uh, basically saying that the club all irelands and the provincial championships should happen this year and I think it's going to become a recurring conversation in the next couple of weeks as these county finals happen and as the journalists begin to ask uh, the managers. Now, up to this point, no manager, when he's in the group stages of a championship or a quarterfinal or semi-final, can start publicly saying, we should have that All-Ireland Championship going because everyone will straight away say, would you look at this cocky so-and-so, he thinks they're going to get through to the All-Ireland series. But do you sense now that there's going to be more and more about this? Yeah, you kind of flagged it up about maybe a month or six weeks ago. Uh, if some manager had talked about provincial championships and all Ireland championship, it would have been pasted on the dressing room wall. Actually, it wouldn't have been pasted on the dressing room wall. It would have been pasted on the outside of the stand because no one would be able to see it if it was inside the dressing room wall. But people would have, it would have been put in WhatsApp groups. It would have been, look at these cocky so-and-sos. They think they have the county final one already. And funnily enough, that, that does serve as motivation to a lot of people and people, um, people can get energy and drive off that but I do see it like particularly particularly you know Carafin, um Bally Hale, these counties that are going for you know going for you know would we'll be going for three in a row and four in a row and are at the upper echelon of the club game where yeah a county title is unbelievably satisfying but despite what some people have said back to me on Twitter, like at the start of the year, Bally Hale must have been thinking about a third club all Ireland. They had to have been thinking about a third club all Ireland. They don't care what anyone says. When you're up around that end of things, you have to be thinking of that. And I would expect I would expect managers to be to be saying it a bit more. Particularly Stock Neil is a is a brilliant example because that's where they really test themselves. That's that's what they really thrive on is that coming up against Kula or coming up against Bally Hale and testing themselves and seeing where they stand at the national level and that pecking order. So yeah, I definitely expect a few more people to to put their head up and uh, and make that debate over the next while. And it's and it's a very very fair debate. Yeah, and even Michael McMullen, he was uh, he made contact with the GEA for uh, DerryNow.com, and the GEA confirmed that there won't be any U turn on this decision, which I think is very very disappointing. And Fergal McGill, who's the GA's Director of Player, Club and Games Administration, he said it's not being considered. There will be no provincial or All-Ireland Club Championships in 2020. It's unfortunate, but something had to give. But from my point of view, there's been 50 years of the All-Ireland Club Championship. Could we play it in January and February? Michael Michael McShane was saying we'd need just five weeks to do it. And for the sake of a couple of counties doing without a few players for the early parts of the league, I'd, I'd love to see it happen. I, I think it should be revived, and I think there should be a big cause for it. Um, just on next year, see, the whole inter-county calendar is going to have to be ripped up next year anyway, because you're going to have, the All-Ireland Champions are going to finish up uh, six days before Christmas. Like, are they going to be back training the first week in January? I, w- I wouldn't think so, because it's just, it's like, when you think of the long-term gain of that, there is no long-term gain, and be uh, everyone will be flagging by the time you get to April and May. So next year is going to have to be, this year is obviously completely different with Winter Championships, but to me, next year is going to have to be completely different too. I spoke to, to Mick Bohan, the Dublin ladies boss, about that, and he was just saying, like, do they actually expect us to play up until a week before Christmas and then go back at it again and start back at the league again? So, like, I think if you're looking at a different calendar in 2020, 2021, which I feel you should be, then there, there is room for the club at the start. Like maybe it's some sort of a kind of a truncated league that starts in March next year. And maybe it's the, the opportunity to play uh, All Ireland and Provincial Club campaigns from mid, uh, what do you say, mid January maybe to mid to late February. Um, next year is going to be completely different. And remember, we always played 
uh, all Ireland semi finals and finals at that stage of the year. Anyway, you're just moving the province back to that time. So, I th- I think it, I think it should still be on the table. Next year's going to be next year's going to be all over the place anyway. So there's no reason why we couldn't figure the provincial and the club championships championships into that as well. Yeah, and I know some people will say, but there'll be far more teams involved this time. Normally, it's you're at the all Ireland semi final stage. But, like, fair enough, the provincial championships will happen and there will be more teams involved initially. But every week, half the teams will be gone. So after two or three weeks, the issue will be minimal and actually similar enough to how it's always been over the past uh, number of decades. But anyway, that point aside, we'll move on from that because the Limerick final is on this weekend, Dune against Napierschik. It's some achievement for Dune to get here considering they lost Richie English to a cruciate for the season. Dara O'Donnell, he got injured in the court final against South Liberties early on. And they go ahead, and they didn't just beat um, Kilmallock, they actually bet him up a stick, really, because there was nine points in it late on. Now, Graham Mulcahy got a goal late on, and as ever, he was super. But it was 220 to 117, having been nine ahead. And you just, in no way, shape, or form, are doing one trick ponies. No, definitely not. When you look at it on paper and you're thinking Darrow Donovan is missing and Richie English is missing. Richie English definitely obviously out this weekend. Darrow Donovan probably uh, it's probably up in the air. He's only had a week more to get over the knee injury. Uh, other things come into it as well. There'll obviously be club pressure to, to play a county final, which which Hester should be really. Cause it, but usually playing a county final with an injury would be, okay, that's the end of the year. Uh, you have a couple of months to go and get back right before the county he potentially could be jeopardising his county campaign with Limerick if he plays. I don't know how fit he is to play or if it's a possibility or if it's a 50-50 or if he's an 80% chance of playing. But there's other factors kind of come into it now. He could kind of write himself off for the rest of the year if he does play, even if he only plays a small part in the game. But uh, the likes of, you know, Josh Ryan, Jack Ryan, Barry Murphy that we we know a good bit about Pat Ryan as well. They, they have a serious forward line. Serious, serious forward line. Went down through the names in the backs. None of them would, would uh, backs to midfield even. None of them would jump out at me. But they have four players in the forward line that could really, really hurt you. And if they could get Darrell Donovan back as well, it's probably the opportunity even to, to push another player even further up and, and further bolster things up the field. But um they're definitely no one trick ponies. Like they didn't just they didn't just beat Kilmarnock. They they battered them really like after Pat Ryan got a load of space from, from Gavin O'Mahony and Gavin O'Mahony didn't know whether to follow him or not I think with a player like Pat Ryan you kind of have to you kind of have to have someone tracking him if you have to put someone back in the pocket so be it but he hit seven from play hard to see him probably doing that again realistically in a county final particularly when his cards would have been marked and I'd imagine Willow Dunham would be sitting back in front of him at midfield but um yeah, doing doing her doing her an exciting side and it's not as if they got a late goal to be here. They're here yeah. fully on merit. And they're here with county final experience of two years ago where they probably didn't really perform or show up against the Piercy. So they'll have uh, the bit between their teeth to kind of prove that point wrong. And it's amazing what a couple of years can do. No more than I'm probably expecting McKillidangan and Tipperary having that final experience. You're expecting that Dune will be much better for that experience uh, on Saturday evening. Yeah, I mean, 10 years ago, neither of these had ever won a Limerick senior title. And now you have... Uh, That's Pier- mad, isn't it? That, that, is, that is nuts. Like when you think in the Piercy uh, as a superpower club almost now like yeah I mean it's county player after county player and we'll go through their team in a minute but Dune looking for, still looking for that breakthrough now the last finals in 1989 2000 2018 obviously a couple of years ago so it's probably like you can imagine how they're feeling at this stage in terms of searching for this title now you mentioned Pat Ryan he was centre forward had a point on the board after a few seconds and he was searching for, for ball all over the field and Kilmallock got drawn out so in a tactical sense Dune won that battle Barry Murphy who we've seen play for uh, Limerick over the past couple of years scored a goal against Tipperary in the 2018 Munster Championship he was also inside his, his own 45 at times carrying ball out the field and he's supposed to be wing forward and it, it just ended up creating so much space for that inside forward line Jack Ryan got a couple of goals Pat Ryan was actually fed a lovely ball into the corner now the defender probably should have got it first he was turned over by Dean Coleman. Lovely ball across for Ryan and he finished. But they just created so much space. Will Napierschig allow that to happen? Last year that probably was happening to Napierschig. But I don't know if it necessarily will this year. They seem to have the bit between their teeth ever since losing that first game against Kilmallock. And I mean just to go through that forward line. I mean we, we were talking about it beforehand. Adrian Breen, Kevin Downs, David Dempsey, Peter Casey, Connor Boylan who probably doesn't get talked about enough and William Hen, who was the breakout star of last year. I mean, how do you keep into them? Now, the question I'd throw at you before we come back to the forwards is, 
how is Pat Ryan going to be dealt with here? It's not just as simple as saying William O'Donoghue will sit back because if, if Ro- like Ronan Lynch isn't necessarily a marker of a centre back, he's going to want to do a nice bit of hurling. So I think straight away there's that bit of a conundrum there. And if you're if you're doing, you're definitely saying right, we're going to throw Pat Ryan in here centre forward because he's not going to be marked properly. Yeah, it could be the sort of case where they, where they where they go with a, a marker at a, a marker at centre back maybe, and someone actually man mark him and try and keep keep him out of the game, and probably take the chance that they're going to leave more space inside for the likes of Jack Ryan and even Josh Ryan as well, but probably be confident in the fact that Mike Casey or Cahill King would look after. Him. Maybe Alan Dempsey might slip into a man mark and roll. Cahill King has kind of done that role before as well. well. Thomas Grimes uh, Thomas Grimes would have played the under twenty ones in the back line. He might swap position like Alan Dempsey could go midfield from what I've seen. Cahill King of course was their centre back a few years ago on the Limerick panel. So there's a huge amount of versatility in that back line. Yeah, the, we we could be we could be over analysing while while Ronan Lynch isn't a marker, they might just literally try and crowd out that space around him. Like like Pat Ryan was able to come in as I'm looking at the pitch here, he was able to come in around that 45, 65 midfield area and kind of had a lot of creativity and was able to move around left or right. I'd imagine the Pierce would have a bit too much kind of nous and experience to to leave that much space there and would try and clog him up an awful lot. Like when he got the ball, the last he always seemed to be in space. It's seven points from play in a, in a county semi final is massive, particularly when you're marking like a former county player in Gavin O'Mahony for a lot, a lot of the game. But he had a lot of space when he picked up the ball. Don't expect him to have anything like that space against kind of a well drilled Napierschik side. But tactically, it will be it will be an interesting one definitely to see who picks him up. Kevin Downs went off the last day um, with an injury. I think it was a hand injury. Interesting to see whether he'd be fit. You'd, ima- you'd imagine with something like that, that's not a muscle injury that they'd be able to strap it up or put gloves on him or do something. We saw Aaron Galan with two gloves on for Patrick's well. Um, Man after with, my own heart. Me, there's myself, yeah, yeah, TJ yeah. and Galan and Johnny Glynn doing it. So lads, I think everyone has you know full right to do it at this stage. The trendsetters are doing it, the influencers. All the greats and yourself. <laughs> <laughs> But um, yeah, no, it's it's an interesting one. Like when you go down through, when you go down through the Napierschik team, and you're looking at like Conor Boylan is such an unheralded player. Like he took two balls and just went straight at the at the heart of the uh, at the heart of the Patrick's well defence the last day, and nobody was able to stop him. David Dempsey, like when we were talking about like best hand, best hand in the game, like he's right up there. There's just something about that that uh, lefty coming across catching in the right hand it just makes it so difficult and his hand only goes up at the last second as well uh, Peter Casey William Hay and Adrian Breen they definitely have the forwards to put up a, a massive score but saying that Doom put up a fair score themselves um, 220 last weekend so just interesting a lot will hinge I know Doom got over the line the last day and got over the line very convincingly but a lot will hinge on whether Darrow Donovan can play because if he if he is able to play it is a massive massive boost and it just it probably releases someone to strengthen up another area in the pitch as well yeah the one thing for for Doom is that if you're going to miss players you don't want to miss your star players in the forward line you can somehow it's, it's somewhat easier to find backs now maybe not guys who could spray the ball around like Darrow Donovan, obviously Richie English is, you know, well equipped to pick up any player, but um, at least they do have their forwards. Mikey O'Brien looked to do a good job at centre back the last day. The question for Napierschik is, do you think in any way there there could be a false sense of security in terms of how well they beat Patrick's well? Because they won by eleven and they scored the last seven points. There was that red card for for Shawnee O'Brien on a second yellow just before half time. But even after that, I think Patrick's well scored the next three points. And the David Dempsey goal, which took, there was only two in it at the time. As far as I was concerned, when he carried that ball in, he regathered it after it bounced on the ground. It, it was surely seven or eight steps before he lashed it into the ground or into the net. And I don't think that there was uh, there was any foul in the meter. There was contact, but I didn't think there was a foul. So do you think, to some degree, that would have knocked the stuff out of, out of Patrick's well? But there could be a false sense of security from that win. There definitely could be. And the funny one with referees, when they have adjudicated that there could possibly have been a free or it was borderline, that you're almost given the grace of a couple of steps. Yeah. The referee didn't have it, didn't have his hand out to suggest that it was a free or anything like that. But once he went to the ground, as long as you're not running, taking the steps near the end, there's a chance you fall to the ground and they give you a chance to have a flick. That's happened in a couple of games and some teams even stop when he's taken seven or eight and they fall to the ground and think he's just going to be going for overcarrying. He got his shot away. Uh, the fact that the well were already down a man 
and they're after conceding a goal despite coming out with the first three points in the second half with Keane Lynch in grey form it just it did take the wind out of their sails and games can kind of peter out quite quickly okay we're after conceding a goal maybe against the run of play a bit we've only 14 men and it's very very hard to get get back into it as well so there could there could possibly be a bit of that uh, just an interesting one I, I wonder it's it's it has happened before in Limerick doesn't happen in that many places but what do you make of what would you make of playing a senior county final under lights mm. I personally am not a fan of it at all um, I don't and I don't see why there is a need for it when the game is going to play Saturday and they're not rushing like making this unbelievable rush to get games finished but what do you think yourself about playing a senior county final under lights mm. I, I wonder is part of it to, to do with they think there will be more people at home sitting at home doing nothing and they're probably going to tune in and maybe sell more for this game. Unless, unless it's on t- TV, I'm not 100% sure if it's on TV or not. Uh, in general, I think hurling is better suited not being under lights. Obviously, the ball is smaller. If it gets caught in the floodlights, you can easily lose the ball. And I know there are some players probably whose eyesight isn't as good as other. Maybe it affects them. And definitely leave a comment in if, if you're one of those players or if you think that that's bogus. Um, I don't you know, know the way it, there's a Jew. Do you know the way there's kind of a funny yeah. Jew on the ground in the evening as I, well? It's not. It's not like it's like playing a match. Like we often, we'd often play games at you know half ten or eleven o'clock on a Sunday morning. And it's and to be honest with you, for, for me, it's great because you're getting off and you're getting to go to a match after and not miss work or whatever. But I don't think it's it's entirely accurate with playing a game at two or three in the afternoon. I think conditions are different, and likewise at, in the evening time, I think conditions are different. And the likelihood of a ball getting lost in the light, I just think it's it's different. I just don't think it's natural. Yes, I think uh, floodlights and that is a great alternative when you have to do it and for. Saturday night games and league games and things like that um, and if you need to get fixtures played but for a county final I'm not a fan of it now myself I have to say I, do you know what I don't think it bothers me that much and I think it's a cool spectacle in the lights and I'm trying to think of some of the matches I've played I remember quarter final against Crave Kieran in 2015 and because there was extra time in the first game they had a double header of a Wednesday evening so the first game went to extra time I, I think it was after 10pm before we actually finished the game it didn't bother me that much, I have to say, and yeah, I'd have no real issue with it. And and in a general sense, I'd like to see Friday evening games in the championship, you know, on TV, intercounty. I see no issue with that either. So we'd probably have to be able to get over that. And you see an awful lot of Saturday evening games in the league, especially um, on Air Sport and, and RTE now. I don't really have a, too much of an issue of it, but please, uh, people get in contact and let us know what you think. And, uh, I tell you what, the only thing I will say is from um, from a point of view of lads going to work on Monday morning, it's definitely nice to be able to, like I know no, lads will be able to go out or celebrate and like that, well, have but a it weekend. is definitely in that sense, because you're buying yourself at least, uh, you're buying yourself a bit of time to actually enjoy yourself and maybe not miss work or whatever, but uh, I'm I'm not I wouldn't I'm not the biggest fan of it, but, uh, but I understand the lure of it as well. Yeah. So Club Talk Hurling brought to you by Slattery Sullivan Insurances in Nina. Call 067-56705 and you'll get ten percent off new business quotes with the reference our game. By the way, the Longford final on uh, it was supposed to be on this weekend, but it's been called off because of do you know the log jam with Kilo and the fact that they were suspended. And then there was going to be appeals and would they be back in the championship. So what I'm hearing is there would have been uproar had the hurling not been moved as it would mean that Mastrum would have had to play their quarterfinal on Wednesday and then the hurling at the weekend haven't played their group game last Friday and they have 10 dual players. So, I mean, obviously that isn't particularly fair. And it's all because of this Kilo situation. So the slashers, hurlers, they objected to the final being moved but that fell on deaf ears. So we'll have to wait and see slashers against Mastrum as time goes on. But you know, it's not ideal. Uh, in a county where you know Longford are down in the lower tiers of hurling, it is, and I know Mickey Quinn said the same about about Kilo and their dispute with the Longford County Board and been thrown out of the Longford Championship. I don't think it helps hurling in that county or and in counties similar when it's treated kind of like that. Now the only can, thing can we call a say, spade a spade? Pretty much no one in the county would care. Uh, apart from the players involved and maybe their families, um, yeah, pro- may- may- maybe not. Okay. And even within but, some families, they'd be like, "Are you going off playing that hurling?" Yeah, well, I've I've heard it from you know a couple of lads that would, um, a couple of lads within some of the clubs that would be involved there and would have won a lot of county titles. Their own clubs would have even like, and they think that 
like lads going off playing hurling and they're saying you know we've won five or six county titles and they've had to play one game or two games to win them but I don't know the only thing I will say is you're never going to be able to promote or grow a game within a county when things like that are happening because it, it wouldn't something like that just wouldn't even be it wouldn't be heard of in you know a higher tier county okay and the, the cabin final is on this weekend as well you were looking into that a little bit yeah, Mullahorn at St. Joseph's against Cool Celtic. I always think Cool Celtic is a, is a great is a great name for a GA club. It's not what it's like Rammer United in Cavan as well. It's not something that you a name you'd associate with a with a GA club. But Mullahorn, they're on top of the road honour by quite some distance. They're going for four in a row. It's a repeat of the sixteen and seventeen finals which Mullahorn prevailed in. Uh Cool Hill last won their won their last county title in twenty fifteen. So an interesting one there. Just in Donegal, it's at semi final stage in Donegal too. So you have Bunkrana against St. Eunans and you have Satanta against Port. I once took a training session up in Satanta many, many moons ago. So I always have a, I always have a bit of, a, of an affection for them. They'd have Danny Cullen who would have played who still who's, I think he was captain with Donegal last year. Played with Cooler for a year back in twenty twelve. Yeah, 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 that's right, yeah. And they'd have Declan Coulter as well, that the former Armagh player and probably probably the best player that he got have at the moment so they'd probably be favourites there to be winning that yeah so the Dublin hurling final is on this weekend Ballyboden against Kula obviously I, it, it's difficult for me to say too much about this but you're probably you're talking about the two teams that have won the most county titles in the last 10 or 12 years and it's the first time that they've ever met in a final which kind of reflects the fact that like until 2007 I think it was Ballyboden hadn't actually won a county title and maybe before that weren't too big of a name Cool had won a few back in the late nineties, or sorry, the late eighties, early nineties. But other than that, probably not contesting for a long time. And it's now the last few years, the last five years, that there's been some huge matches between the teams. Yeah, there have. Yeah, like, like Ballyboden, we beat Ballyboden in the Leinster final by a point one year, and they were they were always threatening to do something at that level. Never quite got back there. Got back to a Leinster final, obviously, uh, a couple of years ago. But I think a lot of people, even before their county final win two years ago, would have thought that maybe Ballyboden had had their time. You know, like Conal Keeney's. Uh, the age of this Colin Keeney is reaching he's like he's closer to 40 than he is to, to 35 now at this stage and um, you would have just thought maybe that their time has passed and then Kula like a kind of a superpower taking over winning back to back club all Ireland but in fairness to Bally Bowden and in fairness to, to Joe Fortune he's kind of reinvigorated them all again there's still a lot a lot of the same faces that you would have seen so you still have Shane Durkin obviously there Paul Ryan Niall McMorrow Colin Keeney um, Simon Lambert, James Madden as well, a lot of the same names that have been there for the goods of the goods of the last decade, coming up against uh, a cool side that got a fair rude awakening against Nafina earlier on this year, but have bounced back in in fairly uh, spectacular style. Um, I'd say from a cooler point of view, the fact that the fact that Khan was back in action for the footballers last weekend in their in their football semi final and B football semi final win over Temple Oak Sing Street is a massive massive boost. Just that he's not coming into the the hurling final cold or anything like that. That he has a, a game under his belt, albeit a football. Uh, you'd have to be favouring Kula here. You'd have to be. And just one question I'd, I'd probably have in my head is when when Bally Bowden went in that brilliant run to the Leinster final two years ago. Colly Pascal hit three five from play against Coolary in a, a Leinster semi-final but yet he's highly unlikely to play and I don't think he's played any part with the, with the Bowden with the Bowden hurlers this year that might have been a, a marriage of convenience at the time because the footballers were gone and he maybe wasn't involved with Dublin at the time but the, you're looking at where else where else in any other club in the country would you have it where they'd be in a county final and a lad scored 3-5 in Leinster semi-final two years ago and there's not a hope probably of him being involved. Imagine like you just couldn't see that happening in a, a rural club. You co- I, I couldn't envisage it happening in any other many other clubs at all, to be honest with you. Such is the strength that they have available to them. Yeah, well you see this is something that happens more commonly in Dublin because the numbers are so huge that if you if you don't show up regularly for for both codes or for one code more so than the other, you're probably not going to be used because you've so many lads training so hard. It's actually set, probably sending out a fair message to the guys who are being dropped in the first place. But also, like when you have a player who's pushing so hard to go for, for inter-county in that particular code, it's far, it's far more likely that they mightn't line out for the other code with the club. I mean, I'm not 100% sure what the situation is. 
uh, with Collie Basquette, but he's obviously an unbelievable player. And who knows, maybe he will feature to some to some degree. I'm not sure. But uh, just the semi-finals then to recap on the scorelines: Kula 117, Luke and Sarsfields 13. And with like 12 minutes to go, Luke and were ahead, and and Kula had a, a surge late on. And Colm Cronin was definitely a huge part in the second half there. Bally Bowden then they beat Nafina 115 to 12 points. And after the score that Nafina had put up against Kula, I think if you convert goals to points, there was over 30 to be limited to just 12. I mean, that is Bally Bowden completely shutting them down. Totally. It was an absolute shutout, in fairness to them. And kind of, we kind of flagged it up in the, the preview of that game. It was kind of the young, emerging talent against. You know, the real wily experience side in Bally Bowden. Just be interested to see whether Bally Bowden are able to take Kula into the trenches. Uh, you can't have much of a comment on it, but like, based on results and based on how things have gone so far, I, did Kula have not been nearly as convincing as they have been in other years, in my in my opinion, anyway. So I, I think there is still possibly a bit of vulnerability there and Bally Bowden will try and hop all over that and really, really make it an absolute dogfight. I don't think they're going to win a big high-scoring game, but that's sort of a 115-12 to 12 points game that they won against Nafina, that kind of an arm wrestle game, I think they have a far better chance of winning. Like if Khan gets in for 1-3 or 1-4, I, I, I don't see them winning the game. But uh, I, know, I know my colleague in the, the Independent, Frank Roach, did a piece about Dublin Super Clubs uh, there the other day and he referenced the, the figures that Bally Bowden have and while their figures are absolutely outstanding with, with club players and things like that it still is an unbelievable feat for Bally Bowden to be in football and hurling finals and for the likes of Simon Lambert and Colin Keane to be playing in both and for Kula to be in a senior A hurling final and a senior B football final regardless of numbers it's still a massive achievement and unlike unlike Lockmore and Tipperary who we'll talk about in a few minutes they don't have the same manager so they are serving two masters um, two masters and generally two completely different squads it's not yeah. the same lads that are making up the two squads like you're realistically talking about Khan nearly and Khan alone that, that's that's playing the two of them so um, yeah fair, fair play to the two of them and it's, it's going to be an interesting final I, I would probably be favouring Kula but there's that slight hesitancy that I just think that Bally Bowden there might be a bit of vulnerability in Kula now that might have been gotten rid of by the fact that they were able to bounce back from the Nafina game but as you said even against Lucan they were two points down with 12 minutes to go and it was a big finish I wouldn't see I wouldn't see Bally Bowden fading out of that game or of a county final in the last few minutes against Kula maybe like like Lucan did but uh, Kula but just about I think mm. and actually Bally Bowden have four guys involved in Bowden Simon Lambert scored a goal last week for the footballers in their semi-final win against St. Jude's Kula, I, th I think it's four as well. Mikey Conroy, I'm pretty sure, plays with both. Uh, Dermot O'Flynn, and I think John Shannon might be uh, involved with the, the Kula footballers as well. And then, of course, the, the senior B hurlers uh, are also in the county final, which I'm involved in, um, against uh, St. Finbars. But you wanted to talk about Eamon Trolley or Dylan, the Dublin forward. Like He's, he's a free-scoring sort of player. He's a great character. Yeah, no, he is. He's obviously be like for for for, for your side to be winning that, you're probably going to have to shut him down. And Trolley or Dylan, uh, I just remember asking him before about the origins of his nickname because he he's such a he's such a different character in the GA. Like he he'd respond to anybody on Twitter or put up any sort of a thing on Twitter. Uh, it could be the days before a match, it could be the days after a match. Uh, just kind of a yeah, a unique kind of a fella, a bit of a kind of a throwback. And just asked him about the name Trolley, and it's it comes from. Eamon Trolleybus, that was a nickname for Eamon McTomas, a 1970s TV and radio presenter. And uh, I don't know how somebody said, someone called it Eamon's Trolleybus, and they ended up calling him Trollier as a result. But I don't know, it is it is just stuck anyway. But uh, just something on, on Kula, I've been in the, the senior B as well. I think the fact that Kula are contesting, you know, a senior A and a senior B hurling final is, you know, an unbelievable sign of their rude health. Like, I remember when Burr were going back really, really well back, you know, in the golden period, late 90s, early noughties. Burr won intermediate titles in 97, 98 and 99 while winning, you know, Club All-Irelands in around that time as well. And obviously, I don't know if it's the same in Dublin, but when you win an intermediate, you have to regrade seven of those guys. So seven of the 1997 winning team cannot play on the 1998 winning team. I'm assuming that would be the same in Dublin. So 
Or we're able to win the intermediate titles while using essentially different teams for each one and just showed the kind of power that we had at that time and even like for Kula to be in a B final and if they win it as well just shows like because the, the competition in Dublin Senior B is serious competition you know the, the Kilmacud Bs the the Nef Barra they're obviously going to be a strong side at senior level as well and it just shows I suppose the level that Kula are at in fairness uh, the Galway semi-finals are on this weekend. Cap no against... comment. No comment about the how strong cool are. No. <laughs> well, all I'm saying is the full back and the B team isn't so bad. <laughs> uh, so the Galway semi-finals are on this weekend. Cap against St Thomas's and Turlockmore against Loch Ray. So the uh, the first thing that comes to mind is Cap have been in semi-finals recently, and I think they lost a couple of them to Liam Mellows. You can't keep getting close and never making that breakthrough. And if you're going to make a breakthrough and get to a final or win a county title, you're going to have to beat a big dog someday. So they, they actually just have to make it happen at this point. Yeah, it's funny. I, I Even though they're back in that stage, I don't think they're going as well as they were other years. Um, I, ju- I just, I don't, I don't sense that same kind of, like, they're delighted, I'm sure, not to be playing Mellows because Mellows are kind of the bogey team and they're beating a score, I think, in the last two semi-finals. But I, I just don't I don't get the sense and even just from reading different bits and pieces and chatting different lads that they're going as well as they were a couple of years ago and then they're coming up against a Thomas side that look absolutely hell bent on three in a row. You look you you know, we've talked about, you know, with certain teams or big clubs lack motivation. After the Boris Lee game last year, I'd say Thomas is like they had their bit between the teeth straight away to go again in Galway and try and get out of Galway and compete at all earning level again. Now they obviously don't have that opportunity at the moment anyway to compete at, at provincial and Ireland level. But I, they look like a side that are hell bent on, on making a three in a row. They've they're star studded all over. They've been really, really slick. They scored a pub against Portumna uh, early in the season was absolutely outrageous. And even like the big climber daily was a one twenty three to two sixteen, but like they were 121 to 14 up with the game nearly over and it just kind of petered out and they conceded a couple of goals Anna Burke flying up front Connor Cooney taking the freeze up front and going well David Burke chipping in from midfield Ushie Flannery doing well too I think Fintan Burke has went back full back and kind of shored things up there too and Shane Cooney is by all accounts hurting out of his skin and laying down a marker to be number 6 for Galway this year yeah. so there's a lot of lads and even like Fintan Burke wants to be on the Galway team this year after disastrous injury last year. Shane Cooney wants to be on the Galway team. A lot of those lads have a lot of points to prove and want to be in the form of their lives coming into the the uh, coming into the county season. And I, I just don't I just don't think uh, I'm not sure Cavan Tiger would be able to keep it up to them to be honest with you. Yeah, nearly always all, nearly all of that Thomas's forward line has played with Galway from minor and upwards. You know, Aina Burke, Dara Burke, Connor Cooney you've mentioned, the Oshin Flannery you mentioned. And then David Burke is always gonna he's always gonna chip in with one or two points minimum. That that's generally the way with him. And their semi final win, quarter final win was probably more impressive. Like Capitagle beat a Haskra who'd had a couple of late shows to number ones uh, seal their senior A spot for next year and number two to get through to that quarter final. They took over in the second half. But yeah, it is probably hard to make too much of a case for Capitagle to win this game. But I, I would hope that they'll stick in there and give a good account of themselves, and, and I'm very sure that they will, but you would have to just about go with Thomas's. The other well, semi- it's, like this, it's like this, Shane. The only thing I would say is they came into the last two semi finals with probably pressure to uh, perform. They're, like, they're obviously back where they wanted to be again, but there's an awful lot less pressure to perform, and bookmakers' odds would suggest that they don't, like, not that they don't have a chance, but that they're definitely heavy, heavy underdogs. They've got loads of talent. Jam Manion up front, he's going to have to have a big game. They, they, they hit a big burst 10 points in a row against the Haskra after extra after half time and they just kind of kicked on they're there they're the same level of expectancy isn't there maybe that will play to their play to their strengths but I just I just find it hard to see why how Thomas's wouldn't be winning with a handful at least to spare yeah Turlock Moore against Lockray is probably the more tasty of the two semi-finals and one of the big keys for Lockmore this year who have an up-and-coming team young players who've hit the ground fairly much running and I think they um, they probably bullied Lee Mellows in the quarter final which is something you would have thought would have been the other way around because Mellows are a grizzled team but Johnny Cohen going into full back for them has been key and you've talked about Finton Burke going full back for St Thomas's it's such a crucial position at times you nearly have to have a lad that you're happy to leave them there and expose the odd ball will go in and you know what it's sink or swim back there at full back 
and you're just going to have to come out and win the odd ball that you probably have no right to. And you could see Johnny Cohen doing that, especially at club level. So it'll be interesting to see how Turlock Moore try and attack him. And the, the big thing that stood out for me when you're going through that Turlock Moore team is that the two midfielders are Dahi Burke and Fergal Moore, who have both played in the full back line for Galway. So you've actually got your, 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 full, your two full ba- native full backs in a midfield, which I think is quite interesting. Yeah, that's a mad kind of a scenario, isn't it? Obviously, mm. we were kind of talking off off air today about the likes of Fergal Moore. He's obviously gone off the county scene, you know, three or four years now at this stage. It suits a lad like that not to be exposed in the full back lane. It suits him to be out around the middle of the field and be able to make his own runs. And you don't necessarily have to be at 100% the whole time, but you can be at 70 or 75% getting to places and getting on ball and helping lads out. So yeah, and it's I so different from that, the olden days when, like, the slower you get, you're moved back to full back, whereas now it's the most athletically demanded position because you're isolated against the superstar. That's a fact, yeah. Like we were saying, like when you get older, I'm, I'm saying to you, that Martin Brandy, my colleague in the Independent, he said to me, he told me I needed to get out of the full back line because he told well, he told me he, he wasn't uh, wasn't very nice about it, but he told me my legs were gone. He said you need to get out of the full back line. He said Tomas Mannion was playing cornerback for Galway and was caught for pace a bit. They put him centre back and Galway won all Ireland. And it's funny now you you can get a probably get away with experience and that playing maybe six, eight, nine, eleven. Those kind of positions there, it's more maybe your head than your legs. So it's kind of funny and kind of I suppose it's just how modern GA has changed that you see more experienced lads out around those positions now and maybe been taken away from, you know, corner forward or corner back or full back or that. But this is a ropey game for Turlock Moore. I think this is a really ropey game for them, I have to say. They're coming in as favourites, reasonably strong favourites. They're coming in with a decent a decent vein of form, but they're coming in against a lot great team who seem to be absolutely coming of age. Now this might come a small bit soon for them. Uh, but they're not coming up against a Thomas side yet. Do you know what I mean? They're not, they're not coming, coming up, up against, against a team like, that's done it. You know, yeah, exactly. More, we're expecting them to do it at some point, but yeah. and and I think it feels like now should be the time because you've still got Fergal Moore in the team. He's not too old. He's obviously still performing. You've got Dahi Burke. Jamie Holland is a good centre back. You've Kevin Hussey, who's been on the county panel. Sean Loftus, Sean Lennart. So you've got everything you need, but you still haven't done it. So until you do it, no one's necessarily going to fully believe in you. Yeah, and they're coming up against like uh, this is a dangerous, a dangerous enough kind of lock race side. You know, they played well against Capitagal in the group stages, but their 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 quarter final win over Mellows was on a different level by all accounts. And just chatting to people around that were at the games and that, like it's they're kind of saying it was memories of the old lock Ray team, all that kind of heart and steel and toughness, but with even more quality. The likes of Emma Manny, Johnny Cohn, we mentioned Paul Hoban and Niall Carey are kind of the experienced players. And then you have like some Mark McManus at centre forward, one of the younger players. And it just said, and this is the thing that probably impressed me most, even against Mellows. They said the longer it went on, the better Lock Ray got. And they just looked to be a team that was full of confidence last year, or full of confidence. They were obviously, I think they were in a quarter final last year, well beaten, but they seemed to have absolutely come on massively. And they'll definitely sense an opportunity because it said they're not coming up against. Thomas's, or they're not coming up against, up against maybe a big kind of superpower. They're coming up against another team trying to make a breakthrough. And I probably have this game maybe more of a 50 50 game than, uh, than the odds would suggest. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a tasty fixture. And there wouldn't be much of a rivalry between them, but probably would be to some degree at underage based on, uh, on what I'm hearing. Um, so we'll keep an eye out for that one for sure. The Kerry final. Now, there could be ha- skin and hair flying in here when Kilmoyle meet uh, Causeway. Just to recap on the semi finals, Causeway would be ballied off with plenty to spare, 119 to 22 points. And Kilmoyle, who have John Myler training them, they beat Abby Dorney, 120 to 112. So it's a fairly intense rivalry, two neighbours. There's generally some rows between these two teams. And when that sort of stuff is happening, and when players are probably taken out of their comfort zone, they're trying to go out and hurl their game. But if people are getting into your head, if there's rows happening, you can have games where anything can happen and the result can go either way. Yeah, I think it was footage a couple of years ago of a couple of kind of mad things happening in the, in the Kerry final. And uh, it's just, as you said, Kerry is one of these places that has a pocket of absolute hurling fanatics. Kilmiley, Causeway, Lixnaw and a few more would definitely fall into that bracket. And uh, it's it's uh, it's bitter enough. It's it's kind of it's bitter enough. It's it it's definitely there's definitely no lack of want 
from anybody involved anyway and strange things can happen in these games expecting another good final because we obviously won, la- won last year uh, the first in a couple of years and would be favourites going into the game but that would probably that would probably suit Kilmeny. It's not as if they've been away from from County Honours for too long. Like they won it only a couple of years ago as well. But an interesting game. Interesting with John Myler being involved as well. He's kind of been on and off involved with Kilmeny for the goods of the last you know four or five years. He's and he loves them. He absolutely yeah. loves them. I interviewed him a while back, and ah, his his love for Kerry Hurlan is, is huge. And apparently the O'Connor brothers are playing quite well, as is Daniel Connells and Tom Bernan. And in the Causeway side, apparently lovely balanced team. Colin Harty had a super final last year. Billy Lyons, he scored nine points in the semi final with five of them coming for freeze. Causeway will probably be uh, favourites, but sure, Kilmiley will only love that. They definitely will. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be an interesting game. Hopefully, the Buff will be back there and he'll be uh, entertaining the whole nation with different videos and Snapchats and different things going on in there. But uh, always an interest, a really interesting county final, without a doubt. As will be the Tipperary County final this weekend, Lockmore Castellani against Killadangan. Two teams that I think are quite similar. They, they try to use the ball well. They, uh, they're not going to go long ball all day. And the only thing that would kind of separate them is the superstars are on the Lockmore side, Noel McGrath and John McGrath. Now, I previewed it with Shane Brophy at the Nina Guardian, and you can go and watch that video on our game.ie. But you've got the superstars on one side, but Killadangan, a team that have been here a couple of times in recent years, will feel they've left it behind them. But there's no real weakness on the team. They just have a spread of very good players. Yeah, yeah, it's funny what you say there about two teams that play similarly. I think Lockmore play the way they play probably because they play they play an awful lot of football. Like the vast majority of this team will be playing football as well. It's more sharp passing, it's more possession based, it's more off the shoulder running, it's you know, surrounding the man with the ball, it's cutting off space. I was chatting to somebody who watched the uh you obviously watch it, but I was chatting to someone else that watched the Nina game and he said it was almost like like the Lockmore players were telepathic. It's like they knew where the ball was going to go and they were able to kind of almost corner and hem the, the Nina players in, real kind of football kind of style and tactics. Then on the other side, Kildangan do play that kind of way as well. It suits the type of player they have. You know, they have a lot of very fast, skillful, mobile players and that sort of possession game suits them. It'd be interesting to see they hit eight or nine wides the last day in the first half against Trump and it didn't hurt them. But if, if that were to happen in a county final, like it did last year, and like it has in many big games for them, it'd be interesting to see whether that kind of gets to them as well. It maybe has got to them a bit before. We talked about county final experience with, with Dune and Limerick. Like Kildangan have been beaten in three county finals now. This is their fourth county final in recent years. Uh, chatting to Bill Lawler after the match, their manager. And Brian Lawler. Saying, Brian Lawler, sorry, yeah. Until you get over the line, you're always going to have that. But he was trying to justify it by saying, like, like you've been beaten by some really good teams, beaten by a Boris Lee team that ended up in an All Ireland club final, beaten by you know Torres teams that ended up contesting Munster Munster finals. So it's 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 an interesting one. I think it's priced up pretty well. Kilangan are about four to six, um, Lockmore six to four, thirteen to eight. Uh, they're Lockmore. They 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 probably do deserve to be outsiders, but it is it's not quite fifty fifty. It's probably sixty forty. Kiladangan, but there is that kind of nagging thing in your head if you're from Kiladangan, that nagging thing of, or just we just haven't been able to get over line in that big game. Now if they do get over line, the floodgates could open over the next couple of years, and with the age profile of their team, they could easily win two or three Tip County titles over the next couple of years. But you have to get there to, for that release valve to, to happen, basically, for that to actually, just for that confidence to explode almost. And as you said, with the McGraths, they, and they play really, really cute in fairness, uh, the way Lockmore play, uh, John was the kind of the one that was the difference last day going in full forward and scored, I think, six from play. Like, if they have big games, if, if, if Noel, Brian and John have big games, it's hard to see lot more beaten and it'll be interesting to see how Killing and Gobo trying to shut them out. Yeah, I actually I can see both teams performing here. Like Lockmore come in with the knowledge that they can win a double. They they won it back in twenty fourteen, both codes, which was unbelievable stuff and obviously they're going for that again. Now Killadangan, they've probably to some degree feel that they've an element of no show in both of their county finals in the past uh, four years there. Certainly against Burris Lee, I don't think they ever hit top gear and, and obviously Burris Lee shut them down very well in an awful lot of ways and like you could make a case that well maybe Kildangan won't show up again but I actually don't I, I can't really see that being the case 
They started off the, the group stages this season scraping a draw against J.K. Brackens and they were not impressive. They got a last second free and possibly even a debatable one just to even claim a point that day. But I would say that amounted to a kick up the behind that they probably needed. And they've been very impressive since. And while they've been beating teams, they've been holding them at arm's length. I mean, the Tumivara game, they held them at arm's length. The, the game against Drum and Inch, they beat them and held them to nine points. Now, you can make a case that Drum and Inch, they'd gone to extra time a week before, and you know maybe that tired them out. Maybe in a way, they, they'd already done the most of their hurling in that game. But at the same time, you can look at Lockmore's 10-point win over Nina and say, well, look, Nina, they missed freeze early on in the game. That knocked their confidence. Hugh Maloney wasn't playing. Barry Heffernan had to go off injured. Then Jake Morris gets sent off. So in some ways, it's hard to know what to read out of either semi-final win. They were both double-digit wins. But I do think Kiladangan are going to perform here. And if you're talking about a flip of a coin, I'm actually leaning towards Kiladangan to make that breakthrough. If Kiladangan perform, they're going to be very, very hard beat because they have the potential to put up a massive score. Like they, they won, they won convincingly against Drummond Inch without anybody in particular, any one player shooting the lights out. Willie Connors contributed. Uh, Dan Amar actually wasn't on the scoreboard but contributed. Uh, Billy Brian Seymour, thinks, yeah, Billy Seymour scored a point from play. Brian Lockney got one one, but it, Paul Flynn got three points. But if you know someone has a game of games. I would find it very hard to see Kiladanga beaten because there's so many other lads that can chip in along with that. You know, Evan Sweeney scored, I think it was 2 4, 2 or 3 or 2 4 in the championship game earlier on this year against Killer One. But uh, unless they're going to need someone like that to step up, they're going to need someone like that outside of the McGrath probably to step up to win it. I'd probably just be favouring Kiladanga. And apologies, I said earlier they were in. Uh, three county finals already this is obviously their third final and the way the way Brian Lawler justified it was you know in 16 they were relative rookies at senior level and they were hammered by Tur- by Turles Sarsfields and last year they left scores behind this is kind of a third time lucky job they have suppose they always say you have to lose one or sometimes you have to lose two to win one they'll be absolutely hell bent on winning this one it's going to be this. I'm glad I'm, I'm going to this game on Sunday and I'm looking forward to it because it's the sort of game where you wouldn't be that surprised if it went either way. But my slight, I'd be slightly favouring Kildang and slightly, ever so slightly. Yeah, when I was previewing it with Shane Brophy, I suggest to him that maybe Alan Flynn would go and man mark John McGrath, who's been playing at centre forward, and give Barry Heffernan an off problem in the semi final because you know Heffernan obviously wants to sit as all centre backs do. And he was obviously doing anything but he was moving around the place and collecting the ball. Now David Sweeney likes to, to sweep up from centre back and he gets on an awful lot of ball. And Shane Brophy suggested that maybe he would man mark um, John McGrath in this game. But I still think Alan Flynn, now there'd obviously be a, sm- a slight mismatch in, in high balls here and that could definitely cause problems for him. But I'd be almost looking, can David Sweeney try and sweep from wing back? I mean, do they bring an extra man back? Will Willie Connors go on Noel McGrath sacrifice his game? Is he even suited to that game? So those are the conundrums from Kiladangan. And in a way, Shane was saying that he just reckons Kiladangan will more so go out and play their game and let Lockmore kind of worry about them. Yeah, I'd say Lockmore are the ones that would have to make more changes and maybe go specifically after who's going to be marking who. I don't think Kiladangan would be as bothered, maybe out, outside of the McGraths. And I, as you said about Willie Connors there, I don't, I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's the type of role that that would suit him. Might suit, might suit Joe or Ty Gallagher maybe a bit more. Um, Willie's going to get in an awful lot of ball and just kind of conducting things from the middle of the park there for Kiladangan. So I don't see him sacrificing his, sacrificing his game and sacrificing a lot of you know creativity and creating scoring chances for his side by marking a man but there's an awful lot of interesting little things that that are, that are going to happen like it's a mad it's a mad week for Lockmore really and a mad week for management and players and like even you know David Kennedy even in goals is a, is a mad kind of story he's obviously an All-Ireland winner in 2001 now he's playing back in the goals for them uh, crazy kind of time and just even a, I saw a tweet there um, the Lock, Lockmore legend Eddie Connolly passed away five years ago today actually 
five years ago and I know that was that was there was an awful lot of hurt in the club over that and uh, I'm sure they'd love to to honour him even if, even if it is five years later by lifting a damn brain and then going on and trying to win the football next week against Long Island Commercials but uh, yeah it's going to be an interesting game it's it's, probably, it's the game of the weekend I think it's easily the game of the weekend to be honest with you yeah and in the Seamus O'Ring Cup final which would promote the teams to the senior status for next year Laura Dora against Mullinahone so that's a meeting of Patrick Bonner Maher and Owen Kelly, if we can just personalise it down to that. But there's certainly a level of intrigue with that. Yeah, the two of them, of course, will forever be that sickening little tap on the head from the 2010 no, final. No, that, that was Noel McGrath and Owen Kelly. Yeah, Bonner was doing it. They were, they were doing it to Bonner as well, 100%. I remember. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it'd, be funny, it'd, be funny if, if, it'd be funny if Kelly went up to Bonner or something during the match and started going like, started going like this. But, um, yeah, no, it's an, in, it's an interesting duel. Laura, uh, Laura owner John McIntyre had a bit of a disastrous year last year. McIntyre wasn't over them. And they've bounced back well this year. They've, they've turned, like, they were beaten by, by Turtles' B team in the first game. And I remember chatting John down at the Galway races. Uh, probably about two days later and he was he was so deflated you could see it in him and he, John's never won John wears his heart in his sleeve he'll tell you exactly how he's feeling and there's no problem telling you and uh, there was probably a bit of worry there about whether they'd be able to pick things back up but they picked them up brilliantly in fairness and were, had kind of a convincing win over a convincing win over killing all in the semi-finals and then you have all the experience they probably got a lot of legs you know the likes of the likes of Colin Fogarty and even Brian Hogan heard and centre back for Lura. And then there's experience at the other side. Paul Kern, Owen Kelly, obviously have Sean Kern mixed in there as well. Uh, that, that should be a cracker of a game as well. That's on the Saturday. Pity as well because, uh, you know, usually you would have an Oreen Cup and then the Dan Breen Cup uh, after. But just with times and it's so much harder to do anything like remotely like a double header now that should be like that would have been a very very fitting curtain raiser no doubt yeah and it's interesting you mentioned brian hogan playing center back for laura in the second tier of the tipperary hurling it's similar enough in kilkenny intermediate semi-finals this weekend Owen murphy the kilkenny goalkeeper he's going to be playing outfield for glenmore against list downey the other semi-final then is thomastown who were in the final last year and lost to tullerone against St. Lactons of Freshford as well. So what is it about these uh, inter-county goalies at this stage, including Nicky Quaid into the conversation as well? Well as play outfield with their club, they're all they're generally good athletes. Yeah, they kinda of have to be good athletes. The you know the the ten bellies the ten bellies standing goals is kinda of gone. Like, you know, you just you just won't get away with that. Just being able to stand in goals and because of your the sheer size of you, you're gonna have a stronger puck out and a longer puck out. It's just not like that anymore. Maybe down when you get into the lower tiers of hurling it might be. But uh yeah, Owen Murphy obviously you know, his brother Alan as well there. They're they're obviously a very, very strong side. Obviously on uh, Club All Ireland winners back in the day in the early nineties. This downy were trying for a long, long time to get up to intermediate level and uh from junior. Uh I actually remember taking a session down in this downy many, many moons ago as well. They um they're, they're you know, a real passionate club. You just turn right there about three or four kilometers down the road there before you go into Bally Ragget. Uh, mad passionate as well. Lockton's obviously had a had an All Ireland, uh, an All Ireland Intermediate run not too long ago as around well. 2011, 2010, 2011, around then. Yeah, I think actually Mick Cavanagh lost his spot on the Kilkenny team as a result of it. He never got back in because he was away on duty with his club, but actually he was never a regular starter after again. And then Thomas Down obviously have intermediate final experience last year, so you know, you know very very hard call either of these two games like i wouldn't have an intimate knowledge of you know different lads within apart from the, the main high profile lads but the pedigree of the four of them on, on what we just said and, and so, some of the information you give there uh, any of them would definitely be fitting winners anyway and would, to make that try and make that step up the senior level yeah thomas town i thought were quite good against tullerone last year and we saw how well tullerone stepped up this year at senior grade draw them up valley hale and probably should have beaten them so john donnelly's obviously an important player for them for saint lactons you'd have to be looking at James Maher. He needs to have a game of games, and he has been going very well from what I've heard. Uh, you talked about List Downey. Like, Glenn Moore were All-Ireland champions in 1991, Leinster champions twice, won in 1999. Uh, that's the last time they won Kilkenny. Senior football champions in 2009, and they have a junior All-Ireland back from 2016. And like, It's a fair selection of players when you've got the inter-county, like an, an All-Star winner in Jerry Aylward, all-star winner in Owen Murphy and Alan Murphy who we've seen hitting the freeze in the last couple of years for Kilkenny too is more so during the league than anything else 
But um, plenty, plenty of good action to be had there in Kilkenny over the weekend. The following weekend, then the senior county final is on, and we'll preview with that. I have a preview with Owen Murphy of the final coming up. I think I'll have that out on Tuesday, uh, the week of the final. Westmead semi finals are on this weekend Castletown Gagan against Castle Pollard, and Loch Lane Gales against Clon Kill. So Clon Kill looking for a three in a row. Yeah, Clonkill are looking for three in a row. Very, very strong side again. Have always done well at Leinster level as well. The likes of Owen Price, um, uh, Niall Mitchell, and they have Brendan Murta as well. Brendan Murta is obviously, it's a funny one because he's a selector this year with Westmead under Shane O'Brien, and he'd obviously be playing with a lot of lads that he will be uh, selecting or not selecting over over the over the coming months as well. They're coming up against Lachlan Gales, who are led by Tommy Dyle, obviously towering fullback. You'd have to be fancying fancying Clon Kill and that side. Other game between Castle and Gagan and Castle Pollard will be pretty tight. But yeah, getting to towards the, the getting towards the real kind of uh, busy time there. I'd, I'd still be fancying Clon Clon Kill probably to come through and probably make it three in a row overall. Right, we're coming to our final segment of the week, one we started last week. And we had an old image going for Vernie's, uh, Smooth Vernie's Lock of the Week, but Seamus Walsh sent us an even better one. The whole thing was inspired by The Simpsons, so I'm going to bring it up on screen and you can take it away with your Lock of the Week. Yeah, no, delighted to get last week's Lock of the Week up. Uh, came up quite convincingly in the wind-up. Had Dixborough to qualify, uh, beating the Lachlan Gales at 11-8. to 8, and ended, up, ended up getting through, thank God. Handy enough in the end, it had... They had five or six points to spare in the end. This week, again, there's not as many hurling games as there would have been in earlier weeks, but I'm actually going for something that's actually not a senior hurling, not a senior hurling game this week. I'm going for Mullen the Horn in the Seamus O'Reen final at six to five. Uh, just based on the semi finals, Mullen the Horn had a brilliant win over, you know, a Newport team that are really, really coming of age. Joe Quaid involved with that Newport team. Uh, Mullen the Horn still have Owen Kelly, maybe not as mobile as he used to be, but still flying over freeze. Paul Curran still playing a massive role and Sean Curran and Mark Kyo now not the Mark Kyo that's involved with Tip another Mark Kyo flying from Mullen the Horn and at 6-5 to five, I think they're real value because Lura are in a final that they haven't been in in a long long time they have a lot of good young fellas the likes of Colin Fogarty obviously and Brian Hogan turned out the field but it's hard beat experience in this final and I just think Lura, Lura beat a kill all side that were without their tallies man John Bubbles O'Dwyer in the semi-final and I just think the farm lines coming in for Mullen O'Hawn into the final are a little bit stronger I would personally have Mullen O'Hawn favourites I know I won't be I won't be too popular with uh, our near neighbours here just across the border in Lura but I just think Mullen O'Hawn's experience and see them, see them home at 6-5 to five. Um, one, other, one other bet Thomas's are 2-5 to five to beat Capitagal and there's no handicaps available at the moment. I, I cannot see Thomas has been beaten. And I think if if closer to the game, you're able to get a handicap of minus three, minus four, minus five on Thomas's, I'd be taking it. I just think they'll overpower Capitagal. I think Capitagal were better last year and the year before than they are this year. And I see Thomas's winning causally enough. Mm. Okay, and then, uh, yeah, and you said do, doomed to win plus six as well. So, yeah, um... Not so bad. We have it all said, haven't we? The Dune to win plus six is um I, I think that'll be I think that'll be tighter than the Limerick County final suggests. But I don't I still don't know. I think if Napiershig are going to win, they might win convincingly. So I'll just stick with Mullen O'Hone six to five and Thomas is two to five. And if you can get any handicaps on Thomas's minus three or minus four, I'd uh, I'd take a bookmaker's hand off for him. Okay. So that's it for Club Talk Hurling this week, brought to you by Slattery Sullivan Insurances in Nina. Call 067 56705 and give the reference code our game and you get ten percent of all new business quotes. Thanks very much, Michael. Fair stuff, Shane. Cheers.